Um, but we're going to put 2 Corinthians up there. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3. 2 Corinthians 10, and we'll read verses 3 and 4. I don't think we're going to turn to a lot of scripture, but if you take notes, this tonight might be a good night to take notes. So let's just go ahead and read this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray that you would speak through this message tonight, Lord, that your living word would come alive and that you'd minister to every heart and every mind and every soul, Lord God, minister to our spirit, man, Lord God, cause your spirit to become even more entangled with our spirit, Lord, that we would fall in love with you, for you told the Samaritan woman that he that will worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth, oh Lord God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. My message tonight, I titled it, Jericho, a forgotten stronghold. Jericho, a forgotten stronghold. You know, that's beautiful because when you think about the fact that when the children of Israel faced such a, what seemed to be such an insurmountable odd. As a matter of fact, like, I'm sorry, Eric, could you put me on channel two real quick? And, and I'm going to, I, I, I didn't know for sure if I was going to do this, but I wanted to, 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 I had a map and I just wanted you to see something before we get flowing good in the message if it, if it all works out. So I had this little map right here, two little things that maybe I wanted to show you, and I don't even know if this map is gonna show up good or not, uh, to where you'll be able to see what I want you to see. Um, let's see here, what is going on with my little thing in the bottom here? Okay, here we go, there we go, boom. So it's, it's probably not real big, but, but if you could see this is a cutout. Okay, out of a Bible map. And, and so normally whenever I draw the little picture up here at the bottom is the Dead Sea. All right, what I want you to see right here more than anything, I'll put my own little picture in this thing. But this right here, I took a picture of what somebody would have thought Jericho might have looked like. Okay, and that's it right here. Maybe I should have used a different ink than black. But you get the point there. Now, but what I do want you to see is this. This is the Jordan River. You see that? I'm kind of thickening it up a little bit. We're not going to stay on this map long. Y'all just bear with me. I like maps. Because you know what? My daddy used to tell me this. He said, boy, if you ain't been there, you can't talk about it. So I've never been there. But I try to look it up in a book. At least I can understand it a little bit better. So, but I do want you to see, to understand something. All these red spots on the other side. You see all these red spots right here? Boom. All that, these are the victories of Joshua, okay? These are the victories of Joshua, but there was no victory until they crossed over the Jordan. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about that in a moment. They, they had to be able to cross over the Jordan River, and the Jordan represents something. And, and again, I'm going to explain this a little bit better. But before they could cross, really cross over the Jordan and begin to enter the promised land that God had promised them and begin to walk in the victory that God had promised them, they had to deal with this stronghold. Jericho was a stronghold in the life of the children of of Israel. Now, listen, I got to tell you, this graphic that I made here is much bigger than the scale of the map because I just wanted you to be able to see that big old graphic right there. They really could have gone uh, anywhere around here. You know, God could have let them come around this way. They could have bypassed Jericho and, they, and it had, had the Lord wanted them to be able to do it that way, but that's not the way the Lord wanted to do it. The stronghold had to be dealt with. In order for them to be able to move forward in the promises of God. And so whenever we look at this, I read to you Corinthians, but, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about Jericho because it talked about casting down imaginations. It talked about the pulling down of strongholds. That's New Testament truth that so vividly connects itself to Jericho. And I didn't even realize it until I started to study it more because he said, for though we walk in the flesh. Now he's talking about our physical bodies right there. Sometimes the flesh represents the sinful nature. On that first part, it's not. It's talking about our physical bodies. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war 
after the flesh. We cannot engage spiritual warfare through our own wisdom, through our own mindset, through our own ways of doing things. We really have to learn to yield to the Spirit of the Lord to let Him have His way. Now, I want to just talk to you real quick about uh, some of the concepts about the children of Israel. This is a little bit of a teaching and, uh, and, and, and we'll see how, the, how it flows. One, first thing I want you to know is this, is that it all started with a promise. It started with a promise in Genesis 17, where God told Abraham, I'm going to give land to you and your descendants after you. Abraham had to believe God according to the promise. God still gives promises today. God has given promises in his word. He's spoken promises to you about your life. Some of you about your ministry, things that you would do for the Lord. He's given promises to this church already. Can we agree on that? Let me see your hand if you can agree that God's given promises to this church and to this body of believers. Amen. And so in order for the promises to come to pass, we there's a part that we do play in it, that joint participation part. That part where we yield to the authority of God and we listen and hearken to his voice and we, we bring ourselves under his authority and we allow him to teach us and to walk in his ways. So the promise was given to Abraham. And one of the things that's interesting in that story, as I was reading it earlier, is that God said, listen, I'm going to give you this land. Now, you do understand that the land was so important because what God did was he brought the children of Israel. Ultimately, he did bring them into the land after time frames of disobedience. They end up becoming slaves in Egypt and all of these other things. But he ended up bringing them into the land. And then once he gave them the nation, we know what happened. Fast forwarding through, Jesus was born in the land of Israel, which was the promise that God had originally given to Abraham to begin with. That's why God had given him the promise that he would have a land, that he would make a nation out of him. And that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And Paul tells us, and I know I've said it many times, that when he said seed, he didn't say seeds as of many. That would be the nation itself, but one seed, and that was Christ. And so this was all part of the big plan of God. And God, again, has a plan for our lives. But he said, after he promised them about the land, he said, now listen, now you've got to circumcise yourself. You got to circumcise yourself and you got to circumcise everybody that belongs to your house. You're going to circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it's going to be a sign between you and me that we're in covenant together. Now, we know that God is not telling you and I or the men in this room to circumcise ourselves to be in proper covenant with the Lord. But the word of God says in the New Testament that there's a circumcision of the heart. There's a circumcision of the heart that comes through the spirit. The spirit of the Lord begins to wield the knife and begins to circumcise the heart. What are you talking about? I'm talking about those things in our life that God is not pleased with. Whatever they are. Whatever the Holy Spirit would speak to you and he would speak to me about those things. Has he already spoken to you about some things in your heart and in your life? I know he has. If you've been in this church for any length of time, the Holy Spirit has already spoken to you and me about things that he wants to deal with. He wants to begin to cut them away. See, the end result of that is something called consecration, yes. sanctification, yes. where you become separated out. See, that's what he said. Whenever you circumcise yourself, it's going to be a sign that you're in covenant with me because the Egyptians they didn't circumcise themselves. That provided an environment for God's people to be separate whenever they were enslaved. And Egypt, again, is a type of the world. As a matter of fact, now I, wanted, I told you that it started off as a promise. God said, I'm going to give a land to your people. Abraham never saw the promise come to fulfillment. But God's promises did come to fulfillment. And Abraham believed God. Amen. Abraham believed God and it was counted into his account. That's the idea. As righteousness. He believed God according to the plan of God. That God would give him a seed. And that seed ultimately would result in Jesus. Now real quick. I want to just remind you. Because we're about to talk about the wilderness. That's really where we're going to start our story. When we talk about Jericho. But before we do that. It started with a promise. But then the children of Israel were Egyptian slaves for what? 400 years? 
approximately. You might get a couple of different numbers, but the idea is about 400 years. And in Egypt, which is a type of the world, we've talked about that a lot, right? Why? Because the world enslaves people. Right. God's people were slaves within the world system. Pharaoh is a type of the enemy trying to enslave God's people. And then with the Passover, happy Passover, by the way, today's Passover, amen, at least that's what it says on my Apple uh, phone, that today they're celebrating Passover, you know, Yvette and I were talking about it earlier, there's a couple of different days, that one to two days in a row that you can celebrate, and you got to remember, it's, it's Passover, if today's the day it started, or at least, I don't know what time it is in Israel right now, but their day starts at 6 o'clock at night, and so, anyway, happy Passover. Pray hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for sending the Passover lamb. Amen. And, and so, but on that night for Passover night in Egypt, God had warned Pharaoh and he wouldn't listen. And so what God told that his people that were called by his name to do was to get a lamb that was without blemish. Right. And that they were to sacrifice that lamb. And then they were to take the blood and paint it on the doorpost and the side post. And then they were to go inside, they were to roast the lamb. Fire represents judgment. The judgment was going to fall on the lamb. The judgment fell on Jesus, hallelujah, when he died on the cross. And so these were all types and shadows 1,400 or so years before Jesus ever showed up. See, that might not get you excited. I'm just saying, like, I'm not trying to be mean or nothing. But, you know, you probably get, I do, I get excited when people get filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't get me wrong. I get hallelujah. I get excited when people get healed. Praise Jesus. No, really, I do. I'm getting more and more excited. But I get excited when I find stuff in the Word of God that the Lord wrote 1,400 years before Jesus ever showed up. Wait, it gets even better. I want to save some of this for Sunday, though. Oh, he was crucified on Passover. What? Okay, let's just go ahead and calm down. So Egypt's a type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of the enemy. The Red Sea. The Red Sea, the Bible says, is a type of baptism. But look, it's moving and it's crossing over from death into life. Yes, right. If you haven't been water baptized, we should be having something coming up in May. I think it's going to be like the weekend of May 12th. Just letting Gene know that's what I'm hoping to do. Anyway, you got to make sure my little calendar works out. But look, the, the Red Sea represents leaving or exiting Egypt. It represents the child of God in the New Testament leaving the world. Hallelujah. And, and look, when, the, when so it represents a baptism because baptism represents new life also. The old man going in the water and dying and being buried with Jesus at the tomb and a new man being resurrected to newness of life. So we have the promise. We have the world, Egypt. We have the Red Sea, salvation with the Passover lamb. And then guess what? Now we have the wilderness. Oh, help us, Lord. The wilderness. What is the wilderness? The wilderness is the struggle with the flesh after salvation. Oh, listen to me, child of God. I'm telling you right now, I'm about to prove it to you in the scriptures. Struggling in the flesh. The Lord told Abraham 400 or more years before the children of Israel were bound up in Egypt, circumcise the foreskin of your flesh. It is a sign of covenant between me and you. Written in the word of God. Moses knew these things. At least coming from the mouth of Moses. As it, and the people of God. They would say. Keep the tradition alive through their mouth. As they would speak forth the word of God. They knew what they were supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. The struggle with the flesh. After salvation. We're not supposed to walk in the flesh. There's now no more condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Many times we walk around, we're walking in the flesh, we're walking in sin, or we're trying to accomplish something in our own strength. There's a lot of different things connected to the flesh. Yeah. Look, faith is supposed to be in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Through that flows grace. Grace empowers to give strength. But it's more than, you can know the message of the cross and disobey the word of God. Right. Now what, you get, what are you doing now? You're walking in the flesh. You're disobeying the word of God. You're rebelling against the word of God. And when we rebel against the word of God, what happens? It throws us off out of proper relationship with the Lord. Yeah. 
Do we think that he winks at sin, my friend? That's why I've been talking about that blanket of justification. Listen, I want to be clear when I say that. Because, look, there's a lot of people that don't understand what it means to put faith in Christ and what he did. And they, they're under a works-based message. And a works-based message will frustrate the grace of God, as Paul wrote to the Galatian church. But even now, once you understand what the object of your faith is to be, and now you, now you learn that you receive grace from the Holy Spirit to live right and to walk right, when we rebel against the word of God, when we rebel against the will of God, then with time what can happen is we no longer hear like we used to hear. And we think we're okay, but we're not okay if we're living outside of God's will. Right? I mean, that's just the word of God, but before they could enter in across the Jordan, they went to a place called Gilgal. Gilgal was a place called, well, the name of Gilgal really means rolled away. And the Lord said, from now on, this place will be called rolled away because this is where I rolled away the reproach off of Israel. Because you see, once they had been brought out through the blood of the Lamb, brought out across the Red Sea, brought out and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, God had a purpose in the wilderness. He has a purpose if you've been walking in the wilderness. He told them in Deuteronomy, for these 40 years I've left you in this wilderness so I could prove to you or show you what is in your heart. God allows us to struggle in the flesh. If this is what we so choose to do, it's not his perfect will. But in the end, he will show us what is in our heart all for the purpose of restoration. All for the purpose of love and reconciliation. All for the purpose that once he sets us free, we won't want to go back. He wants to get us to the place where we don't want to go back. Like the children of Israel, all oh, the melons and the onions and the leeks, if I could just go back. My gumbo was so much better when I lived over there. You know, and said, oh, this manna, this provision that you give me from heaven. Can you imagine that? If you knew that the Lord was providing something for you, and sometimes I think we do that. The Lord's providing something for us, and then we're like, nah, I'm ready for an upgrade. I'm not happy with what you gave me, Lord. Boy, look, that's murmuring and complaining. You won't talk about another thing that the Lord is not pleased with. Amen. Lord, help us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Gilgal is where he brought them back to circumcise them. Joshua. If you go to Joshua chapter 5, and we're not going there, but I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about it. Joshua chapter 5, really going from verses 4 through 7. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But I want you to see this, that he said, look, before we cross over, the Lord told me we've got to bring you to Gilgal. And you've got to get flint knives and sharpen them up, and you're going to cut that foreskin off. So that's where it happened. It was at a place called Gilgal. But then once... They went there. Now, what does recircumcising themselves recommend? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. What is that a type of? What is circumcision? It's a type of getting right. They had been walking literally. Check that out. Literally, they had been walking in the flesh for 40 years because they had not been circumcised. We're going to talk about that in a second. But so recircumcising themselves is a type of repentance. It's a type of acknowledging that they had been walking outside of covenant with God. It's a type of recognizing that they had been disobedient to God's word. And now they're making their heart and their life right again. Amen. Amen. So then they were able to cross over the Jordan. What does the Jordan represent? It represents the transition point from, death, from frustration, from walking in the flesh, to a place of walking in victory. What, what is it? Listen, if you can, if you've experienced victory in the Lord, okay, but you can see where the enemy tries to keep coming back at you and he tries to pull them same old tired tricks, right? And sometimes we still fall for those things. I need you to understand that there is a place of victory. There's a place of victory where when we begin to walk, I believe this with all my heart. Listen, we got to stay consecrated to the Lord. But, 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 but at the same time, Jesus died. The Passover lamb died. He made the pathway. It, because of what Jesus did, it allowed the exodus. It allowed the opening of the Red Sea. It allowed them, and then they have to come back to this place where they recognize they're wrong. But it allows them to cross over the Jordan into the land of victory. But listen, before you can get into the land of victory. You're facing Jericho. Mm -hmm. You're facing Jericho. A stronghold that refuses to go away. 
but it has no choice. When the Lord says it's going to go away, the Lord is going to be a stronghold that is forgotten. Amen. A forgotten stronghold. So maybe you have strongholds in your life. I'm here to tell you the Lord's ready to obliterate strongholds by the Spirit of the Lord. Jericho is the enemy's attempt to prevent access to the promise. Oh, ho, ho. He promised it to Abraham, to you and to your seed, I'm giving, I'm swearing to you, God said. I swear to you, I will give you this land. But whenever God's people don't believe the promise, when God's people live in rebellion and don't submit themselves to the holy word of God, then guess what? The promise lingers. The promise lingers and tears. And then sometimes you can, we can be lining up with the will of God, right? Hold on. Well, hold on, preacher. I mean, I feel like I've been doing good. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> no, really. Thank God that we've, been, that we've been seeking God. But guess what? Jericho doesn't want to fall easily. And that's what I'm trying to say. I don't even know that I'll get into the fact too much. Maybe we will. Let's just keep moving. Jericho does not want to go away. When, and listen, when we're talking about pulling down strongholds and imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God... Let's understand something. We're talking about demonic strongholds in people's lives. We're talking about that, that this is not just your flesh. We're talking about the enemy has a piece of geography and he does not want to let it go. But the Holy Spirit has the power to break the strongholds in our lives. And then finally, Canaan. You know, the old church used to sing all kinds of songs. I didn't even know what they meant. Some, some kind of song about old Beulah Land. Oh, yeah. Huh? That's, that's where you live. What's so oh, Beulah Land. Look, even, even Dave back there, they sang that at the old church. It's talking about the land of promise. It's talking about the land where milk and honey flow. It's the pride, and it can't be just heaven, my friend, because look, Israel won't experience their heaven till during the millennial reign of Christ. They got to go through the whole seven year period, right? And so, it, no, the land of promise represents something that God wants to give us now. The place where the provision of heaven falls in the house of God, in the lives of the people of God. The place where milk and honey flow, where God's provision is here to bring the increase and to bring souls into the kingdom and for people to walk in victory so that we can be witnesses for him, so that we can be prophets for him, so that we can do the work of the ministry. That's what God wants to do in your heart and in your life. I hope you're not getting bored tonight. I hope you're not getting bored with the word of the living God. Let the word of God marinate in your spirit, man. Holy Spirit, give us a hunger and a thirst for your word. Let it come alive on the inside of us. We need your help, Lord. So there it is, Canaan. Later changed the name to Israel. The promised land. God's promise. Tonight, it represents individual victory. Tonight, it represents our church and the promises that God has given us. Not just our church, the church. But he's given promises to this specific church. And so I'm going to hold on to him. And I know Jericho don't want to fall, but he ain't got no choice. Jericho's got to go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So look, I want to just share a couple of passages out of Joshua with you. If you look at Joshua chapter 5, verses 4, and it would run all the way through 7. And if, you know, if Aaron wants to put it up on the board, I'm cool with that. But if you look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 4, it says, This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war died. Okay? In the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. So now all the men that originally came out, the men of war, they now have died. All right. Now, can you go ahead and go to verse six real quick? In verse six, it says, for the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, that is the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished. He's just repeating that, right? <coughs> but I want you to see this. Because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Now, 
I'm going to, I'm going to back up, but then we're going to move forward. I want you to hold on to that. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. There's something even before this that happened. And we're not going to turn to it, but I'm going to tell you about it. That happened where the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt and they crossed through the Red Sea and they were ready to enter the promised land, they sent spies into the land. Hold on a second. Hold on to that. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord had sworn that he would not let them see the land, which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So Joshua tells them to sanctify themselves. Go to verse 5. Joshua tells them to sanctify themselves. He circumcises the new generation of people of God who can't move into the promises by walking in the flesh. You can't move in the promises by walking in the flesh. Look what it says. For all the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. Now, this is a big deal. God sends spies into the land, a representative of each tribe. And he asks them to go to look in the land and to bring back a report. Do y'all remember that story? And what happened? They saw the Anakim. They saw the giants in the land. And they said, I would imagine their knees were shaking. They, we'd be like grasshoppers in the sight of these giants. And you know, I'm pretty sure it was, I think it was Joshua. I'm shooting from the hip, but it was Joshua and Caleb yeah. who were the only two that came back with a good report. Right. And I don't remember which one it was that said it, but Joshua, I'm pretty sure it was him. He said, they're like bread for us. We will go in there and we will eat their lunch. <laughs> Why? Because he had faith yeah. in Yahweh. He had faith in God that no matter what it looked like, no matter how big the enemy looked, he knew that trusting in his God would give the victory. Yes. But the rest of them refused to believe. Yes. And so there they wandered in a wilderness for 40 years. And God said, because you have not believed in me, you will not enter my promises. Church, I think that's a big deal. Right there. I think that's a big deal for your life, for my life. And it's a big deal for this church. Because listen. God has spoken things, and we have to be able to believe him that he is more than able to accomplish that which he said he would do. Amen? Hallelujah. He's wanting us to partner with him. I don't remember who said it today. Somebody told me something today. I don't know if it was on the phone or whatever, but they were listening to somebody that said something or reading in a book somewhere and how the Lord, he does, he wants us to partner with him, but the partnership is letting him be the leader. That's right. And the, part, and the partnership is letting him have his way yeah. and to submit to his will. And that it's really, somebody said, it ain't about partnership, my friend. It's about ownership. Yeah. It's about ownership. Who's the Lord? Who's the king? Yeah. That's what it means whenever Jesus goes from being your savior to your Lord, to the king of your heart. When you say, Jesus, when you come to that spiritual place, when you say, Jesus, I give you the th this heart. Yeah. To be your throne. Yeah. See, that means that you're willing to submit yeah. to him. I'm willing to submit to him. Even when what he asks us doesn't feel good. Yeah. Even when what he asks us, there's no benefit in it. Bro. Uh -oh. Hi. I'm not trying to tell you what, what, what you're going to give to the church or what you're going to give to the pastor. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about what the Holy Spirit is going to ask of you. And ask of me, even when it doesn't feel good, when we know. So first off, I mean, I don't mean to keep being redundant, but we got to first off, learn how to submit to the written word. And then I believe once we start submitting more to the written word, at least this is what the Lord is showing me for my own life. I'm going to be able to hear him more clearly. Some of y'all are hearing him at another level. Y'all are hearing the voice of the Lord. Y'all really are. And I'm very, I'm very like envious with a godly envy yeah. because I, and I mean I have been hearing the voice of God but I want to hear more yes. I wish I could tell you a story about last night but it's too long nevertheless the point is is that I've been crying out and I know that he's yes. doing it yes. but can I just say this too though for those of you that are hearing very clearly from the Lord and you know your own walk with God I'm not here to beat nobody up I'm here to help us all out yes. just because you hear more clearly from the Lord from somebody else doesn't mean you're necessarily walking in the will 
the way that the Lord wants you to walk in the world. We all have to check our own hearts. We all have to be retrospective. We all have to be like Jane said. We got to look in the mirror. Yes. Amen. The reflection. And when we walk away, we can't forget what manner of man right. that we saw. Yes. The Lord knows. You know. Yes. The Spirit in you knows. He knows. We're not hiding nothing from the Holy Ghost. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise yes. God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So here they are. And, 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 the, and they made this. The Lord told them that he was going to give them the lamb. But when they saw the giants, they couldn't believe. And so then the next thing that happens is one act of disobedience. I'm sorry. One act of disobedience results in another major act of disobedience. Multiple acts of disobedience in the 40 years. But the main one I'm trying to talk about is they literally let their children walk in the wilderness for 40 years with uncircumcised force. No, that's a big, big deal, buddy. That may not seem like a big deal to you. But when you're a Jewish part, or an Israelite, a Hebrew, and you have been told by God through Father Abraham, listen to me, they talked about Father Abraham probably every single day of their life. And God had told Abraham what was required. That means they were walking outside of covenant for 40 years in the flesh as they walked during the wilderness journey. One act of disobedience leads to other acts of disobedience. And before you know it, you actually can think that you're okay with God. I don't know who's okay with God and who's not. You're not my servant. You belong to the Lord. I'm the Lord's servant. I know whenever he's done. But sometimes we can have so many acts of disobedience that we can't even the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Paul told Timothy that the conscience can become seared right, right. as with a hot iron. Yeah. When a hot iron is placed upon skin, it sears the nerve in you. You can't feel it. You can't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in you. You can think you're okay. How do you remedy it, uh, Pastor? It's real easy. When you start to realize, when you recognize, when the Holy Spirit starts to deal with your heart, and it begins to reveal to you that you haven't been right, there's a certain posture. I know I keep talking about it, but it's like it's, it starts off like this. And then when the Lord told me, no, lower, boy. <laughs> lower. And I mean, I'm just trying to make a point. It's not just about getting on your knees. It's yielding the heart. Y'all get the point? It's yielding the heart. It's recognizing where I've been wrong. It's recognizing that I want to be right. And it's yielding the heart. And it's relinquishing self to the Lord. It's not just about getting rid of all your stuff and cleaning yourself up. No. He'll take care of that later. It's wrecking the Lord. Take care of it tonight. Or whenever he, but, it, but it's about getting your heart right. Getting your heart right. Repentance means to change the mind. To come to the realization, you were right, Lord. I was wrong. Now I desire to go your way. Hallelujah. So that's what they did. They walked in the flesh. The first act of disobedience led to the second act of disobedience. And now we find ourselves back to the Corinthian past. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, strongholds, you know what the literal Greek definition is? It's a fortress. Is that not amazing? Jericho is a fortress. Strongholds in the New Testament are defined as a fortress. But it also has this added idea. That it's actually an argument or reasoning. This is real important. I know we're kind of getting deep here, but this is a teaching. You know, teaching's important. I want you to understand. It's an argument or a reasoning that fortifies, strengthens an opinion against an opponent. Strongholds are works and tools of the enemy to place a mindset in the lives of human beings. And he loves to put them on Christians that opposes the word of the Lord. If God says, holy, be ye holy, for I am holy, and we don't live that consecrated life, we're in opposition to the word of God. If God says, 
Do not commit fornication. And we commit fornication. We're in disobedience to the word of God. If God says don't be engaged in lasciviousness. And we engage in internet pornography. We are in disobedience to the word of God. If God says trust me. Put me first in your life. Hope in me and understand that I am the answer of everything that you need. And instead, we put our hope in something else. Put in the blank. Fill out your own blank. I know sometimes I actually throw words out there and I'm not trying to irritate nobody. So maybe I won't throw out any words. Maybe I will. I don't know. I feel like I'm about to throw out a word. The, the counselor. The counselor. I got to go to the counselor. Oh, I got to go to the AA meeting. I need Jesus and the AA meeting. Really? You, oh, so Jesus and what he did for you at the cross isn't enough to set you free from that bondage and addiction? No, see, that's a lie. That is a lie that is contrary to the word of the Lord. But whenever we hamstring the Holy Spirit when we don't let the Holy Spirit have his way in the midst of the church when we refuse to preach the truth for the way that it's written because we're scared people won't keep coming back to the church then now we got to start adding some things in the modern church and we come up with a psycho theology we add psychology to our truth and we mix them together and we say we just got to add a little bit we're gonna what, what was it called celebrate recovery God ain't into recovery, my friend. God ain't into rehabilitation. God is into revival. God is into killing things and resurrecting things. God is make, into making new creations in Christ Jesus. He's into filling them with his spirit. And he's into giving them new life, new hope, new fire from heaven. That's what God's into. New creation. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. If, if the Lord said there's one mediator between man and Christ and, and man between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, that means we ain't supposed to be praying to Mary. That's right. We ain't supposed to, that's right. We're not supposed to be praying to the saints. We ain't supposed to be praying to nothing but G through Jesus to the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. But then strongholds get built in the lives of people, lives. Fortresses being built that are like factories that are producing imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. The word imagination is a reasoning that is hostile to the faith. Just pumping that stuff out. This is just too hard. I'm not going to make it. Lie. You're going to make it. Is it hard sometimes? Yes. But there's a whole cloud of witnesses that have gone before you. They've gone before me. Some of them were sawn asunder. They lost their wives. They lost their husbands. They lost their children. They, 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 they died for the cause of the faith. People have been burned at the stake, man. What are you talking about? You're not going to make it. You'll make it if you hold on to your Jesus. You'll make it if you endure until the end. He that endures to the end, he will be saved. So these demonic strongholds are building these factories that are pumping out these imaginations that are telling you things that are lies and contrary to the word of God. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself. Above the knowledge of God. You can bring it into captivity, my friend. Yes. See, something happened to me somewhere along the way, and I used this scripture for years to come against people taking time to rebuke the devil. Oh, listen, man, I overcorrected doctrine so bad. Lord, forgive me. Because let me tell you something. The shed blood of Jesus gives me access to the truth of God's word. And he wants me to hold on to the truth. And listen to me. I can take a, I can cast down vain imagination. Listen, when I'm walking in the spirit, 
When I'm walking and understanding that the shed blood of Jesus Christ has given me grace and access to the power of God, and that enemy brings that fiery dart my way, I can, I can cast that down in the name of Jesus. I bring that thought under the power and under the authority of the shed blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I'm not believing that lie. I'm going to walk in faith and in truth, my friend. And that brings me to my conclusion. Y'all can come up here, singers, musicians, because we need to close with a song. But listen to me. The armor of God. Out of Ephesians, you can put it up there real quick for me, um, for me, Aaron. Ephesians 6, verses 11. And we'll go all the way through 14 as they get ready to think about what song they want to play. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you can stand against the wiles of the devil. We've been talking about that wiles, trickery, his devices, his methods. He's tricky trick, man. Listen, I'm telling you, I don't mean to be rude, but I had a conversation with somebody earlier. I, and it's not rude, it's good. Good and rude don't rhyme, but it's not, it's not rude, it's good. It's good, what I'm about to tell you. Sometimes we, in the world we live in today, and I'm, I've done this before, so don't get mad at me. But if, but if a doctor signs something, now, I can do this. Hold on a second. Is it what's best for your walk? Is it what's best for your ear? Is it what's best for your heart? All I'm trying to say is that the Lord wants this geography. He wants it to belong to him. Don't listen to what I got to say. Get along with the Lord and let him speak. Amen. Well, listen to what I got to say and let the Lord minister to you in that, right? But look, the wiles of the devil, I just want you to know he's tricky. Amen. He is so subtle. He is so slick. I'm telling you, I don't think that... Look, I'm not trying to give the devil credit. As a matter of fact, I'm sick and tired of talking about it. But I'm trying to make a point. If you think that he ain't slick, if you think he ain't got a snare and a trap bait ready for you, a trap stick, the snare of the fowler, like it talks about in Psalm 91, putting that bait out there, leading you down a path when you ain't even... Right, cut your foot and he's like stuck like an animal in the woods. Can't get out of there. Lord, I'm telling you, he's trying to snatch you, snare you, keep a stronghold in you, prevent you from being able to move out and, and to move into the plan of God. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the evil day, church. Listen, you think we're not in an evil day right now? We are in an evil day. And listen, it's only going to get more evil. It ain't, it ain't getting better. There's some kind of kingdom now theology out there that teaches that the church is going to get the world right. It's going to get the world ready. And then Jesus will come back after we fix it. Dude, they ain't no, no. We as Christians ain't fixing this world. This world is fallen. God is not into rehab. He's going to destroy this earth. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And you and I, hallelujah, are going to be able to dwell there. You and I are going to spend eternity with our King. Hallelujah! We have something to look forward to. Right. Take unto you the whole armor of God. This is the part I wanted you to see right here. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Listen, I've taught these, this armor so many times. And you know, sometimes, I don't know, Danielle told me I did a good job on one of the teachings one time. I don't, I have to go back and watch it. I believe her. But look, most of the time, what I focused on was the fact that all these items are Jesus. You do understand that. Now, I'm never going to shrink back from that. In other words, Jesus is your righteousness. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Jesus is the belt of truth. Yes. He absolutely is. But as Paul is looking at this soldier while he's in prison, and he sees him in this, in this, these, this equipment, this arm. He's also understanding that we are engaging in a spiritual world. Yes. And that you and I, what makes us different than the world is that we've received the gift of righteousness from Jesus. The world is not righteous. The world is wicked. It's perverse. The word of God says it's a scolios generation. It's curved and it's perverse. 
But you and I have received the righteousness of Jesus. And it's our breastplate of glory. Hallelujah. It makes us different than the world. It makes us different than the people that we work with. That's why we cannot afford to not walk in righteousness. That's why we cannot afford to partake in what the world partakes in. But the thing that holds it in place is the belt of truth. The belt of truth holds it in place. And the belt of truth will help to combat the lies of the strong. The strong holds in the imaginations that try to come against you and oppose the truth of God's word. If God says he's a healer, he's a healer. If God says he's a deliverer, he's a deliverer. If God says he's given us authority over the demonic and unclean spirits, he's given us authority over demonic and unclean spirits. If God says, God's word says that he has brought salvation, he has brought salvation. If God has said, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If God says the prodigals are coming home, the prodigals are coming home. If God says that our children will walk in victory, hallelujah, we claim your word and we refuse to believe a lie. Let's worship the king, hallelujah.